if, if you belong to Crossbridge, you know this about me already, but Grace, something you should know is I, I, I absolutely love golfing. It's my hobby that I spend the most amount of time doing when it's warm out. Uh, and, and to get out, I actually prefer to go out golfing by myself. While I can golf with people, and if we've golfed together, you know this, I, I'll hang out, but I'm not here for you. I'm here for that little white ball, right? And so I, I tend to mind my own business. And the course that I go to most of the time, I get paired up as a single with all sorts of people all the time from all different walks of life and with all different skill levels. And, and I, I don't mind it because I'm not there for them. I'm there to play. And I just kind of let all the chaos that's going on up here, I, it just needs time to settle. And I need to do that by walking a lot and avoiding the woods. And so I find myself out there each, you know, week, even, even you know, yesterday afternoon, as I'm out with three people I don't know, inevitably it always comes up. So, what do you do? Right? They've been having their conversation. They've been saying what they want to say, talking about what they want to talk about. Again, I don't care. I'm in the woods. You do your thing. I do mine. But inevitably, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor. Oh, you know, and... and, and you know, that's what I get, and it's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I mean, we've been talking about all these things and saying all these things, and you must have been judging us the entire time that we've been out here. And I remind them very candidly, like, no, I, I haven't been judging you. I haven't been judging you at all. And I genuinely mean that. Like, it, it doesn't matter. that they're, they're doing their thing. I'm doing my thing. I'm not judging them, but... but I hear that phrase all the time when I'm out there. Not the cursing side. Well, I guess I hear that all the time when I'm out there, too. Um, if you've played golf, I understand. But I hear, I hear this phrase, you must be judging me. Every time I get out there when I get asked, what do I do? And it's really hard for me to think, how is it that I admit to being a pastor, which means I'm associated with Christians, and your first thought is, I'm judging you. Your natural step and logic brings you to a place that I'm judgmental. And if it only happened now and then, whatever. But the frequency with which it happens makes me stop and ask, what in the world is going on? And to have to admit the sad truth that Christians are judgmental. You know, that stereotype wouldn't be a stereotype if it didn't fit a whole lot. And, and you know, I know you're probably sitting here thinking, uh, if you're a disciple of Jesus and you're like, oh, I've been following him, I'm not judgmental. You're probably talking about those other people. Well, thanks for making that judgment. And now that we're all on the same page, we can continue, right? Right, that's somebody else's thing. They do those things. I don't do those things. I'm better than that. Oh, are we? I think what makes this topic harder is that it's not just outside that they see the church as judgmental, but it's perceived as soon as you come inside the walls of a church that it becomes judgmental. And as followers of Jesus, those who have dedicated our life to the teachings of God through the Scripture, I honestly think that as followers of Jesus, we have judged so many hurting believers and searching non-believers right out our doors. That they have come hurting, come searching, and we've judged them out. I, I, just curious, online, Grace Online, Crossbridge Online, and in person, how many of you here feel like the church is too judgmental? Okay. Some of you are like, yes. Some of you are like, I don't, I don't know. How many of you have felt as though you've been judged by the church before? This is a problem. This is an issue. And honestly, I think that this should break our hearts. This should cause us to stop for a moment and take a sober look at the life of the church, our body of fellow believers together. How in the world do we view those who are outside our walls right now? How do we view them? What standards are we holding people to where they feel judged? And maybe even the tougher question is, do we hold ourselves to those same standards that we're holding everybody else to? 
to judge them and say they're wrong, but never doing those things. We already talked about hypocrisy. Now it works itself out through judgment. And, and I get that judgment can be a touchy subject. I get it because, you know, many outside and inside the church, they use this phrase, don't judge me, right? And they usually are quoting Jesus from Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus says, do not judge others and you will not be judged, right? That's the phrase that people, has anybody heard that before? Don't judge me. Jesus says, don't judge. Anybody else used it besides me? Yeah, all right, good, right? We, we get this, but what is important about this verse in the context of what Jesus is saying it is, like, listen, you need to be really careful, and he's calling his disciples and his followers to start looking at the issues that they carry themselves before they start trying to pick apart other people. He uses, do you remember the little bit of sawdust in your eye versus the stick, or the sawdust in someone else's eye and the stick in your own eye, and he's like, Stop trying to point out the little things in people's lives when you have massive issues that you're not addressing and you're holding them to something you're not even doing. And I think sometimes when it comes to judgment, we use judgment as a deflection, right? If I can point out all the wrong stuff in someone else's life, then their eyes won't be on me. Everyone else in the community, as we point out this issue or this sin, and when I say sin, I'm, I'm going to use this word a lot today. And when I, when I use this word, what I'm saying is anything that we could think, say, or do that displeases God or any way that we live life that doesn't line up with the way that Jesus would, Okay. Anything that falls under that umbrella, I would say, is sin. And so it's so much easier to say, well, look at that sin, and we could back up, right? Let's judge there so that attention goes to that place. And church, I believe it's time to turn the magnifying glass on ourselves. As a body and as individuals, I think we need to take a hard look at why are we perceived this way, and why is that phrase used so often? And we're going to look at two letters from the Apostle Paul today. And in one of them, he's going to address a church in the first one that he has visited quite frequently. He loves this church. And if you have your Bibles with you, I would love for you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It'll be more towards the right-hand side of your Bible. 1 Corinthians, or if you're using your app, all the way down there. Scan a good, Okay. Now, this is, it's called 1 Corinthians. This is actually the second letter that he's written to the church. The first one, he kind of is, is in their face. You guys need to start figuring out how to work together. There's sin issues, these displeasing issues to God inside the church. And when these issues aren't being addressed and no one wants to deal with them, you need to disassociate yourself with those people because they're going to pull you down. There's a standard of teaching with Jesus that we should be adhering to is all his first letter. And now... They've taken this command from Paul, and they've applied it very liberally. They have taken this, and they have put it everywhere. And let's, if you would, would you look at me, look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 9. I'll be reading out of the NASB for this, and it says this. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not all mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the greedy, the swindlers, the idlers, for you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person or a greedy person, an idolater, is verbally abusive or habitually drunk or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge? Judge, this, this word judge here is krino, okay? In the Greek, krino. And it means to sit in the place of a judge, to cast a verdict on a case, okay? And he says, what business is it of mine to make a legal decision on outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside God judges, remove the evil person from among yourselves. Paul hammers this church hard, hard, because they've taken a truth that is important for the church, and they've applied it to the world. That was never the intention of what Paul said or what Jesus said. 
They're running around the city, and they're pointing out everyone's sin. It, you know, Oprah style, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. And, and they're looking at all these people in their city telling them how hard they are sinning. And, and who wants to be part of that city? Who wants to be friends with those people? He's saying, I'm not telling you to do that. But when we do that to our culture, when we point out everything that's wrong, we say to them, when you get your stuff cleaned up, you're welcome to come. When you get your act together, then you're welcome in one of our seats. Paul's floored. The world is filled with sin. And standards that you're holding them to are not fair. And I say that they're not fair because as disciples of Jesus, we're filled with the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin. How in the world can we expect those without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life to be convicted of sin? None of us will go there naturally, will we? That only comes from a prompting from God to change our life. And what a beautiful thing that is. We always think like conviction's this horrible thing. No, it's a sign that God's at work in our life. And Paul's like, why are you yelling at them? They're not going to change. They don't have the Holy Spirit yet. They don't know Jesus. You're holding them to a standard that you're not even holding yourselves to. So do me a favor. Stop judging them. Stop looking outside your walls. And I think that word to the church of Corinth is a word for us today. That we need as a 21st century church, specifically in America, to ask ourselves, how do we look at the world around us and culture around us? And I hope and I pray that when it comes to judging them, the words of Paul from 2 Corinthians 5, where he says, for what business of mine is it to judge outsiders, comes to mind. I think the church has lived like it's our business to judge those on the outside, to tell them how wrong they are, how far they are from God. And all the while, with confidence, we say, but all are welcome. This is probably going to date me, and that's okay, but it reminds me of the first set of lyrics from a song by the band Nirvana in 1992. Uh, anybody, that's really old. All right, cool. There's like, yeah, all right. There's an amen to Nirvana in the back. I like that. Um, actually, the, the lead singer of the band wrote a song called Come As You Are. And the first lyric of the song is, come as you are, as you were, as I want you to be. And the whole song is built around this idea that, like, you're welcome, you're welcome, but the way that I want you. I want you to be comfortable with you, but the really, as long as it's the way that I want you to be. And as a church, we continue to say to everybody, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, but come as you are But after you clean up. Come as you are, but as we want you to look like holding to our standards and our expectations for you, and there's never any time for someone to walk through the process of looking like Jesus because the moment someone comes through the doors, whether they know Jesus or not, why is it that we expect if someone dedicates their life to him that their life would be perfect as yours? And yet we judge them because their sin looks different than ours. And before they even have an opportunity many times to respond to Jesus, they've been judged and they've left. Come on, world, we're here with arms wide open for you as long as you behave like we behave. We're sending a massive mixed message to our culture of what love looks like, what acceptance looks like, but very clearly showing them what judgment looks like. I believe that we are called to hold to biblical standards, that we can't compromise on what Scripture talks about and calls us to. We should absolutely be committed to this, but before we ever have the audacity to point a finger out to our culture and community and try to legislate morality on all levels of our life, neighborhoods, and government, it would probably do us well to read the teachings of Jesus and hold that magnifying gla glass up to ourselves and our hearts. Outside the church, 
we're judgmental. What happens when someone comes to any church and they're an immigrant? They're a young teen or a mom or a woman who finds themselves unexpectedly pregnant. Refugees, those in the LGBTQ community, those who find themselves poor or strung out, they are homeless or communities of color, communities of privileged people who don't look like we want them to look. What happens when someone that always feels judged by the church comes? Will they still feel judged or will there really be a seat for them? Will there really be loving with no agenda? Or will it be just until you look like us? Now, if they come once and they come in our doors, <laughs> that's awesome. But unfortunately, I think once you come through the doors, we can judge each other pretty hard. Amen? Yeah, we can. We can. I, and I understand this. Uh, but we, we're really good about it because we use biblical language to justify it. Right? We hide our judgment through using Scripture as like our, this is nice. And instead of like beating each other with it, we'll like paper cut each other. You know, little cuts that it's like, oh, yeah, well, next. And like, what did you say? And, and it's really weird how we do this. We like to use language, though, that uh, I'd like to look at it with you. We like to use this language of, well, when you're a mature believer, this is the way that you'll look. And when you're a weaker believer, well, that's what weak believers do. And we have this definition of weak and mature believers, but there's no definition to that, is there? There's no way to measure that against each other, is there? Because your thought of what a mature believer looks different than what mine is. So why are you judging me? This idea of weak and mature believer in the passage we always go to is found in Romans 14. So if you would, just wherever you are in your Bibles, jump back one book to Romans chapter 14. And as you're turning there, I, I just let me set this up for you that it is the coolest thing in the world that you should know about this, um, this passage and this whole set here that we're going to look at. I would love to look at the whole chapter with you, but we don't have time for that. But what's important is the Apostle Paul is, again, writing to a church who is in Rome. And they, Rome is the most influential city in all of the, the known world at that time. And so it's written about 56, 57 A.D. And I tell you that because about seven or eight years earlier, there was an issue that kind of went down. You see, there was an emperor. His name was Claudius. And Claudius was is a funky emperor. You could, you know, research him. It's a blast. And uh, this is a picture of Claudius. Doesn't he look great? I mean, I don't, I don't know what he's holding in that hand, but he looks excited about it, right? And so Claudius has this little cool bowl in his hand. And this bowl was great because uh, he loved that the Jewish people were there, as all the emperors of Rome did, because the Jewish people who lived in Rome for a long time, they got along with all the Romans. They paid all their taxes. They even got, like, a special privilege that you didn't have to worship the emperor as a god. You could just worship your one god. But you're a great citizen, and we love this. It's no problem. But around 49 AD, he got frustrated. He got really frustrated because the Jewish people started to fight with each other like crazy. They never did this. They always got along. And they started to fight. And the Latin word, they were fighting over a word. Isn't that crazy? They were fighting over a word, and it was causing this division and massive issues. And the word that they were fighting over in Latin is Christos. Christos. They were fighting over Jesus. Is he really the Messiah or is he not the Messiah? And it started to blow up the city a little bit. And so Claudius is so frustrated. He's like, that's it. Get out. And in 49 AD, he sends all the Jews outside of the city. Now, with all of the Jews going outside of the city, this is those who hold to the Torah as their scriptures and don't believe in Jesus and those who hold to the Torah as their scriptures and do believe in Jesus. There's no difference in Claudius's mind a Jew was a Jew, get out. And that's what he does. So about five years later, he dies, and a guy named Nero takes over. Nero, when he becomes emperor, has this moment of clarity that my bowl is not as full as it should be. This edict to remove all the Jews is affecting me financially. Let's bring them back. And so he brought all of these Jewish people back after five years. And when those who dedicated their lives to Jesus came back to Rome, they found their home churches run by someone else. Who was it run by? They live there. 
they were run by Roman Christians. Those who, you know, were Gentiles, non-Jews, had taken over the leadership of their churches. They didn't hold the same standards that the Jewish people who were coming back in held. They held to their standards out. Now you're back in. Who wants to fight? That's what we're getting here. Is There's like two years of buildup of fights in these churches. And Paul is now saying, like, listen, we're going to have to learn to get along because you guys are throwing shade at each other all over the place and this is what Romans 14 is all about, is Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians figuring out what's right and what's not. And I do feel like I'm cheating you and saving you at the same time as we look at the first two verses, because cheating you with the hours upon hours I've spent in Romans 14, this is one of the most beautiful chapters ever without understanding. But I'm also saving you because I've never been more convicted reading Scripture personally than this. It just wrecked my heart. Let's look at the first two verses. It says, accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. <laughs> Paul establishes two things for us very quickly. Um, the first one is, he says that there are believers who are weak in their faith. There is those who are weak in their faith and those who are strong in their faith. There is a definite growth in our faith, and I think many of us can see that when we look back at our stories going, oh, my faith has increased as I've seen God work. And so, there are believers who are weak and there are believers who are strong. And the second thing that he points out is, People have different opinions on what's right and wrong inside the church. People have different opinions on what's right and wrong inside the church. And, and some things just aren't worth arguing over. Yeah, there it is, right? You don't know this, but many people in church come to their pastor to complain about other people and the behavior that they have. And it's like, why are you doing this? Have you talked to them? No. Why are you talking to me? I, Matthew 18 says there, but, but if you look around, you have differing opinions. Opinions on what to wear, opinions on what to eat, opinions on how to sing, opinions on what instruments could be sung, opinions on, opinions on, opinions on, and we have all these opinions, and I'm pretty sure that Paul knows in this church there's like a hundred different gray areas that he could hit on and bring up. But he's not going to do that. He's going to take it to a place that I think in our culture we can identify with immediately, and that's people's eating habits. You know, this is still a conversation that happens, isn't it? It's crazy to me. Paul is like, listen, some of you think it's okay to eat meat. Some of you have sensitive consciences, so you're vegetarians. Um, and so they argued over what's right to eat, just like we do. Eat today, everyone when they step into some new diet, has an opinion of why everyone else should be doing this. Now, I know that there are some medical reasons that people change their diet. Like, we have, you know, celiac disease in our house, so we have to have a gluten-free diet. There's others who have other medical issues, and it's like, this is why we choose a keto diet or this diet. But for some reason, as diets continue to come up, we look at it, and it's like, what do these things even mean anymore? Why are people choosing to do this? We're arguing over a plant-based diet, a paleo diet, a DASH diet, you know, a sugar-free diet, intermittent fasting. We've got different colored drinks, mind diets, vegetarian diets, low-fat diets, high-fat diets, low-sodium diet. Is anybody else, like, ready not to eat? Right? Or worried about what in the world do I go and shop for? This is unbelievable. And personally, I've seen this play out as I've begun and have cut a majority of refined sugar out of my diet. I find myself in a place that when we're out with friends, everybody's ordering dessert. And I'm like, I'll just get coffee or tea. And they're like, why? Don't you want this piece of cake or this thing? And I'm like, well, I'm trying to avoid sugar in my diet. I just feel better when I don't have it. I always hear my favorite phrase, I could never do that. Why would you choose to do that? Don't you miss this? And there's like a shovel that goes in their mouth, right? Don't you miss this? It's really odd in those moments because I think to myself, 
I don't care that you eat sugar. Why do you care that I don't? I don't care that you're choosing this. Why do you care that I choose something different? And I think we look at each other as church, you know, as fellow believers saying, I believe that I'm a stronger believer because I've given up sugar. So if you were a strong believer, my opinion would be yours. We don't see that. Paul actually says the same thing. Verses 3 and 4, he says, those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. You, or who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Oh, come on, Paul, bring it. Right, bring it. You're fighting over what you're supposed to eat, and neither of you realizes that God accepts you right where you are. Neither of your choices are really that important. You're making the mandates, they're simply opinions. It's not God saying, I'll accept you when you come as I want you to be. It's come as you are, and I love you right there. We're expected to grow in our faith, mature in our faith, but God loves us right where we are, and he pushes it back to the reader. Why in the world then are you judging someone else's servant? You're not their leader. You're not their master. And if you're here this morning and you have placed your trust in Jesus, he is our master. The church is not your master. The pastor is not your master. Your small group leader is not your master. Your youth group leader is not your master. Your parents aren't even your master. Jesus Christ is your master. Oh, that's your sleep. That was an amen moment if you missed it. Okay. That was an amen moment. Amen? Amen. Come on, Grace, you amen him all the time. You've got them really, they respond to you. Crossbridge, wake up, come on. Like, listen, my expectation and opinion is you should do this, but if you're mature, you oh, I just judged you. You see how easy we slip into this? Do you see how easy it is to fall into a place where we forget that Christ is not just our master, but if he's our master, then when you look to the left and look to the right, He's their master too, and their role, their life should be about pleasing their master, not about pleasing you, not about making you happy. And Paul goes on, he highlights, listen, you argue over holy days, and when he talks about holy days, he's talking about when someone chooses to Sabbath, when they choose to take that rest to be with God. Should it be on a Saturday, a Sunday? He's like, I don't care what day you do, choose Tuesday, whatever. Um, It doesn't matter. There's no mandate to a day that you need to pick, you just need to take a day. Don't fight over this. Everyone can have an opinion about your diet, about your holy days. Don't judge each other over this stuff. But he also says in verse 10, why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all stand before the judgment seat of God for the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me. And every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Can we read that last sentence together? So let's stop condemning each other. Paul's not messing. He's not beating around the bush to a church that's divided. He's looking at them saying, stop it. Stop it. Enough is enough. So does this mean then that that we should just let anybody do what they want to do? I've dedicated my life to Jesus, so I'm free to, you know, in my freedom do all these things. Not at all, because verse 13 says, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God, so let's stop condemning each other. Listen to this. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble, stumble and fall. Paul calls the church to a standard that I believe we need in ourselves today. If you're the mature believer, I believe the more mature believer is the one who's willing to give up that freedom rather than flex it on someone because they don't have that same freedom. The more mature believer is the one who could step away from these opinions and say, this one just doesn't feel like fighting over because if I walk into this, that's really going to like mess with them. 
And I love them enough not to do that. My call is to walk with them. So while you might have the freedom from the Holy Spirit to eat meat or to meet on a Tuesday, that doesn't mean that you always should do those things. If you're around someone who's convicted by eating meat, don't eat the meat. You can apply that in our culture to however you want with disciples of Jesus. If someone is personally convicted of something, and you know it, the mature thing to do is not to do it. We don't like that, do we? I like exercising my freedom. A mature faith is going to be one that's defined by humility, love for each other. It's going to ooze empathy for other people, not judgment towards them. In the book, uh, The Deeply Formed Life, one of my friends, uh, his name's Rich Velotis. He's a pastor up in Queens at an amazing church up there. He says this, our level of offendability often reveals the level of our maturity. If we can't overcome offense in the moment, we're not going to get very far. Reconciliation requires us to listen deeply to one another. A mature faith will be patient. It will listen. And when someone else has a different opinion or freedom, instead of telling them how wrong they are, a more mature faith will listen to how they got to that place. It doesn't mean you have to agree or affirm it but we also don't get to judge it. A weak faith, and if you're thinking, is my faith weak or is it strong, is it rigid? Do you force your opinions and rules on others until they agree or leave? Do you know when people do that to you? And if you don't line up with how they think they basically write you off and say, your opinion is different. I can't associate with you. Nothing hurts more than that, to be judged on an opinion instead of a conviction. And I do believe that opinions are what we hold, but convictions are what hold us. We need to be wise not to mistake the difference of when we have opinions and when we have convictions because opinions are things that we hold, and, and, and opinions change, don't they? Opinions totally change. I had an opinion about South Jersey while I lived up in prideful North Jersey until I moved here, and God changed my opinion as he broke my heart. And now when I show up in North Jersey with my Phillies hat on, they're like, what's your problem? And I'm like, I love my city, right? My opinion change. You're allowed to change your opinions, but convictions are the fabric of who we are, and I do believe our convictions have to be pulled 100% from here. Our convictions on how to love, on how to encourage, how to bless, how to reconcile. And instead of judging each other, what if we had a new measuring stick? What if we had a new measuring stick instead of behavior or actions from people, but it was simply love? That humility and love would define how we interact and would be how much am I growing and testing in my faith? Well, how much am I loving God? And how much am I loving the people around me instead of showing them how horrible they are? Is there a seat at the table, my table, for them that I can learn and grow? And if you want to deal with this, I very simply want to give you three steps, and the first one is to admit this and to announce it. If you find yourself as judgmental towards someone, admit it and announce it. And I know you're like, I'm not going to say anything about that. Like, my judgment is kept. You need to find someone that you trust that you can say, this is an issue and this is a, a group or a person or a type of people that I judge. I have that person and people personally. And I am so thankful that there's three or four men who know that about me, that I can say this is my issue. Why? Because sin will always hide in the dark, and if we don't expose it, it will always stay and grow. We will only become more judgmental. The second thing I want you to do is to ask for forgiveness. If there's someone specific that you have judged and you find that Matthew 18 is that place that you want to go to to start, don't come to me. Don't come to Pastor Dave. Don't go to your small group leader. If it is someone 
that you have judged and you need to ask forgiveness, own up and say it out loud, and I have sinned, and I've judged you, and I am sorry. Admit it. And then the last thing is get real. Find that accountability. And find someone who's going to always point you back to the measuring stick of loving God and loving others, not beating them with that stick, but extending it to them to say, come with me, follow me as I follow Christ wherever it is that you are. And I just sit and think today, I dream. What would it look like if two churches were measured by their love, not by their rules? Would we change the entire world? No. No, I mean, we wouldn't. Would we change all of America? No, we wouldn't. Would we be able to change the way the church is seen in all of America? Nope. <laughs> Not at all. But your living room would look different. Your neighborhood would look different. And South Jersey would look different. What if that's enough for today? Could you imagine if we admitted where we failed and invited those who think we're judging them into a love relationship with Jesus to place their trust in him. And they believe it because they've seen it. Let's go and love, not judge. Love and not judge. Let me pray for you as Pastor Dave comes up to close us out. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit and his conviction in our life, and I thank you this week that there is so much time spent with you that I have felt this unbelievable darkness and heaviness of sin in my life, that I am a judgmental person. As much as I don't want to be, there are things that I judge and people I judge, and I, sometimes I don't even know why. But I am so grateful Holy Spirit, that you shine light into our lives and what the enemy would desire to shame us, you use to reach others and bring healing. And so, God, I pray that you would bring freedom from judgment, that we would wrestle hard through this and our own part in it so that our homes, our streets, our neighborhoods would look different, not for our pleasure or to flex our maturity, but simply to introduce more people to you because they need that healing hope and love. Jesus, thanks for the privilege of walking through this together. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Man, were y'all ready for that? I was not ready for that. Incredible. I share that dream with you, Jimmy. Um, and I believe, and I know Pastor Jimmy believes, that the church is the institution that God has placed here to change our neighborhoods and to change our communities, to change South Jersey, and that eventually trickles to the world. And, um, man, so encouraged by that. And I know the rest of the week I'm going to be singing that Nirvana song. But what a great picture, amen? What a great picture of the church, how we want people to come, but we want them to come in a certain way. Um, and that's caused a lot of church hurt uh, in our past. Let's stand together here this morning, and I'll dismiss. I'm so encouraged you've been here. Uh, if you've been visiting us, I I'm so grateful that you've come. I pray that you felt welcomed here. Uh, please stay, and uh, we'd love to shake hands with you, either if you're visiting here from Grace or from Crossbridge. Um, if you're giving uh, from Grace or from Crossbridge, if you're giving here at Grace, we do have a drop box kind of right in my office door uh, that's hands-free. You can leave an offering there. We do have uh, giving online. Crossbridge, uh, you're continuing to give uh, online, and I just want to thank both churches for being so faithful in that. Listen, that is one of the scariest things that we experienced during COVID. <laughs> It was, is the church going to be continued to be faithful financially? And y'all, I know both churches have just uh, been incredible with that. So we thank you. Uh, but let's pray here together and then let's go and let's serve the world. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we come to gather in this place. God, we thank you for these two local churches who have come together these past few weeks just to dig into your word together. God, I thank you for this strong word from Pastor Jimmy here today to to check our judgmental hearts, Lord, to 
keep in mind how the outside world looks in at the church and to keep us in mind how we look at our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And God, and I pray as we leave this place that we would stop condemning each other. God, that we would put love and grace above judgment here this week. God, I thank you. I thank you for how your spirit continues to grow in us. God, I thank you for your son Jesus, for the sacrifice he made on our behalf. God, I pray here this morning that if somebody is not trusted or placed their faith in Jesus Christ, God, that they would not go one day longer without the assurance of knowing where their salvation lies, and that salvation is in Jesus. God, that our sin had separated us from a loving relationship with God, but Jesus was the bridge to bring us back. And by simply placing our faith, our trust in him, we could be saved. God, I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We pray all this in his holy name. And the church says, amen, amen. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you so much for joining us today for our service of When Church Hurts. If you find yourself in a place where you need prayer today, maybe that message is a little uh, raw for you. We want to invite you to reach out because we would love to pray for you. From whatever church you're from, would you reach out to your pastor and let us know so that we can be praying for you this week. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And whichever church you're from, if you want to continue to give towards the missions of our church of reaching people for Jesus, we'd highly encourage you jump into those links and give the way that you normally have been so faithfully and generously given to the mission of loving people. We love you so much and we're thankful for you joining us. We'll see you next week.